Brooklyn apartment, sitting in front of the famous bookshelf that you all miss. Here it is, the lovely, famous bookshelf. It is a lovely evening. I'm here in my Brooklyn apartment. It's late. I'm a bit tired, but I'm going to get on here and talk for just a little bit. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to hit the subscribe button. Be sure to hit the notifications bell. Many of you are probably here right now because you got notifications. So be sure to hit the notifications bell. Um, and we will just have a little chat, a little update on world events. Um, and, uh, that'll be all. Um, so Basically, the way we do things, if you're not familiar with the format, uh, we generally, I give some opening remarks. Then from there, we do our roll call, where I call you all out as I see you, names and locations. And then from there, after we've done our roll call, um, I answer your super chat questions. As they come in, I'll be writing them down. Um, and from there, after I answer your super chat questions, then we're done. Um, so I'm not planning a really long update for tonight, but I figured I would talk to you all here on Monday evening, uh, before going to sleep. Uh, my wife is already asleep in the next room and, uh, yeah, I'm sitting here in front of the bookshelf and we are going to have a late night conversation on a few things that are happening. Folks, I don't know if you all saw Yesterday, I went on George Galloway's show. Uh, George Galloway, the longtime dynamic political figure in British politics, a longtime member of parliament, an anti war activist, an anti imperialist, uh, a, a fighter for the working class, a fighter for the Palestinians. Uh, he's got a great program called the mother of all talk shows and i went on the show and one of the topics that we discussed was the strange silence of the biden administration the strange silence of the biden administration and um it's pretty weird folks no state of the union address no state of the union address very vague statements and messages very strange. Very, very strange. The Biden administration is one of the most silent administrations. They have come in silently. And I personally am convinced that this is happening because there are some... Oh, you're very welcome, Mateo. I am convinced that there are some maniacal schemes going on behind the scenes. That's what I'm convinced of. I am convinced that something is going on behind the scenes. And folks, for those of you who are not aware, I did write this book, Kamala Harris and the Future of America. And I talk in great detail about who our vice president is, and where she came from, and how she was forced on us, despite the fact that the American public rejected her at the polls after Tulsi Gabbard exposed her record as a vicious prosecutor who tried to keep an innocent man on death row and who uh, very much uh, was a proponent and a builder of the prison industrial complex, locking up people and destroying their lives. Um, Kamala Harris is a very scary person, a very, very scary individual. And um, as we watch the administration silently silently plotting, it seems. I think my mind is on Kamala Harris and the faction behind her, the Hillary Clinton State Department, permanent revolution, regime change faction. Um, so I am certainly concerned about this. So my mind is on Kamala Harris and how dangerous she really is. This book that I wrote uh, amid the lockdown last summer. Folks should, folks should check this out. Um, but we're seeing a silent administration. Um, it's also pretty clear there is, there is division within that camp. Now, one thing that's worth noting is that the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran is selling huge amounts of energy, oil, natural gas, to China. As much as the imperialists have tried to demand that China not do business with Iran, as much as the imperialists have tried to demand that China not be able to 
you know, be you know, trading with people on the international market, China and Iran are getting closer together. Venezuela and Iran are getting closer together. Russia and China um, are getting closer together. Dylan Burns TV, I don't know who that is. I, I, I generally debate people. I'm okay with debating people. I'd, I'd have to look into who that is, but I, I would probably do that. Right? The countries around the world that the United States cancels and declares that they're no good, no one can do business with them, they just trade with each other. They just trade with each other generally. Um, and that's that. Uh, they do business with each other and the ability of Wall Street to cancel countries and, you know, just wipe them off the world market seems to have evaporated. Um, you know, we all remember that, you know, North Korea, after the fall of the Soviet Union, North Korea, until then, until the fall of the Soviet Union, North Korea had quite, um, quite, quite a strong, strong economy. Uh, Marx on feelings of oneness. North Korea had quite a strong economy. Um, but then the fall of the Soviet Union came and they could no longer get petroleum because of the petrodollar, right? Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, you could only buy oil in US dollars. North Korea was unable to continue purchasing oil, petroleum, and their food system, their food production system came to a grinding halt because they could not get petroleum. And they had a period in North Korea's history that is referred to as the arduous march because they couldn't import petroleum and their food short their system came to a grinding halt. They had food shortages. In Cuba, after the fall of the Soviet Union, because Cuba was subject to all kinds of U.S. sanctions and isolation, uh, there was a period of, of very extreme economic hardship in Cuba called the special period uh, where Cuba did not have the supplies it needed and you know and there was there was food shortages and 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 such but nowadays um, if you look at the global economy okay the United States tries to cancel Venezuela tries to do to them you know give them this treatment where no one can do business with them and so the USA gets close uh, and so Iran gets closer to Venezuela the USA tries to cancel Iran and say no one can do business with Iran Iran gets closer to China. They don't have the ability to do what they once did. Um, much like during the Cold War, you had Comic-Con, or the communist bloc of countries that were able to trade with each other. Um, now we're seeing kind of a global axis of resistance that is emerging. And that global axis of resistance uh, is kind of enabling countries to continue trading with each other and preventing, preventing the kind of canceling uh, that you know, the USA is trying to carry out. It feels like the Biden administration is in a position of weakness. A lot of the Trump administration's policies alienated the United States from its allies in Europe, uh, the NATO allies. Um, and uh, the United States is in a bit of a weak position. So how exactly they will move forward in their latest geopolitical schemes, how the Wall Street and London monopolists and big bankers and the Pentagon will move forward with trying to roll back uh, countries around the world that are struggling for their independence. We will have to see what the next move is. Uh, it should be quite interesting to see how they maneuver. I wanted to mention also that here in New York City, there is a big shakeup. I should say in New York State, technically. Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York State. Uh, the New York State governor is facing possible impeachment the scandals around sexual assault and around the nursing homes and his COVID order uh, is, is escalating to the point that uh, it looks like he could be impeached. And it makes me wonder, because at the beginning of the pandemic, Bill de Blasio, the New York City mayor, uh, and Andrew Cuomo uh, started talking about big tech and reinventing New York City. A lot of the buildings in New York City are currently being purchased by Silicon Valley corporations, um, right? Good. Capitalism. Be a communist. All righty. And um, so there you go. 
Uh, I, I think it's interesting that Cuomo seemed to be on board with reinventing the city post-COVID. He seemed to be on board with it. Um, de Blasio seemed on board with it. Bill Gates was on board with it. Uh, Google was on board with it. Amazon, Jeff Bezos was on board with it. But now it seems that as the city is beginning to move ahead, look, restaurants are open. I see people walking around outside. You know, the city is starting to come back to life. And, uh, you know, people are thinking that by June, July, we're going to be fully open. Everything might be back to normal. I mean, we'll see. Fingers crossed. You never know. But as that begins to happen, as we start to move toward that kind of a situation, it seems like there's a feeling that the nature of New York City will be changed. And Andrew Cuomo uh, does not seem to be part of, of the vision of those who want to remake New York. Now, you know, uh, obviously these sexual assault stories sound very credible. I don't, I don't think they're li- the victims are lying at all. They sound very credible. But it's interesting that, you know, that he's, uh, that he's now facing these allegations. Amid Me Too, amid the, the, the huge rise of awareness of sexual assault and all of that, Cuomo stood firm. He was safe. There were, you know, he, didn't, he was not brought down by allegations. Me Too, when the, at the height of Me Too in 2017, Cuomo stood firm and, and seemed safe. So it's very interesting, um, you know, and this nursing home scandal, right? It seemed like at first it was only Republican media that was talking about it, but it hasn't gone away. Um, and, he ha- and, and, you know, questions about the numbers he presented. So we'll be seeing what happens with Andrew Cuomo. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting. Um, you know, Cuomo very much represents kind of machine politics in New York City. Look, here in New York City, we have a statue of Christopher Columbus, right? It's in Columbus Circle, 59th Street. And of course, amid everything that's been going on for the last, you know, two, three, four years, uh, you know, there's been calls for that to be removed. Christopher Columbus, let's not not forget, committed horrendous atrocities against Native Americans, uh, you know, was very vicious to the indigenous population, was even punished by the Queen of Spain for the way he treated Native Americans. And many indigenous groups asked that this huge statue of Christopher Columbus in New York City be removed. Andrew Cuomo refused to do it, saying that removing that statue of Christopher Columbus would be offensive to Native, uh, be offensive to Italians. It would be offensive to Italian Americans to remove that statue. Now, now, what's going on there, right? Everyone hears that and immediately nods and thinks about machine politics in New York City, uh, ethnic constituencies, uh, how city government, uh, you know, there's a lot of ethnic associations of various, various ethnicities and that are very afraid and, and that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. And you, know, you look at that and they say that removing Christopher Columbus, you know, even though, you know, the liberal... The liberal momentum, they're tearing down Confederate statues all over the country. You know, they're, they're tearing down statues here, and the Democrats are all about statues being torn down, and CNN is all about tearing statues down. And Cuomo gets up, and he's like, oh, no, we can't da- take down the statue of Christopher Columbus. That would be offensive to Italians. I mean, we just we can't offend the Italians. Um, interesting, interesting. And it seems like, in a lot of ways, you know, Part of what's going on with the wokeness, you could call it. I mean, not really the wokeness, I guess, but part of what's going on is amid the pandemic, uh, there is a kind of an attempt to uproot networks and political networks in the United States, to kind of uproot, uproot, you know, long entrenched kind of, you know, circles of power and long entrenched entities in the United States. It's not simply about tearing down statues, but it's tearing tearing apart, you know, political networks and, uh, and circles of power and circles of influence that have long had a lot of influence, right? Silicon Valley uh, seems to be at the center of an effort to try and kind of restructure American politics and get rid of a lot of these powerful local constituencies that had a lot of influence. And Cuomo, I mean, he very much is the New York City machine. Uh, look, his father was, was very powerful. I mean, he, he came into power because of his name, Uh, you know, and it seems to me like there is an effort to uproot this. And this goes, there's, there's a long tradition of this, uh, in the Democratic Party. Uh, great example of this is, uh, Ab Scam. Do people know about Ab Scam? You ever see the movie American Hustle? Um, it's a fictionalized account of something that really happened. Um, and that was called Ab Scam. 
and Abscam was when the FBI, under the direction of Jimmy Carter, it was Jimmy Carter's FBI, uh, you know, dressed up a, a guy like an Arab sultan or a sheikh um, and dressed him in a costume and sent him around the country uh, with suitcases full of cash to bribe politicians. And, uh, you know, it was a sting operation where, and it was short for Arab scam or ab scam, where they had this, this guy dress up in the head, you know, that the robe and the, the, the head thing. And, the, you know, and he walked around and spoke Arabic and, and he walked around and, and they would set up a meeting between him and members of Congress and he would try to pass them a suitcase full of money. And in many cases, these politicians were smart enough. They were smart enough to say, no, I'm not going to take a suitcase of money from a, a, a foreign leader. And they would push the suitcase back, but they would arrest them anyway. Uh, you can look at some of these cases. It's really disturbing. Um, you know, that, that you know the, the one politician pushed the suitcase back to him and said, I don't want it. But they still arrested him based on some innuendo in what he had said, right? And that's, I mean, uh, you know, he had said something like, well, I can't take your money now, but maybe we can make an arrangement later or something. Boom, they got him. They got him. And many people noted that it was Jimmy Carter. It was the Carter administration that carried out Abscam. And they weren't going after Republicans. They were not going after Republicans. It was not Republicans who were targeted by Abscam. Uh, Abscam went after... It specifically went after these kind of local Democrats that were tied in usually with labor unions. People called them the smokestack Democrats or the labor Democrats. And these were guys who were usually Italian. Sometimes they were Irish. Um, and they were usually pretty socially conservative against gay marriage, against abortion, but very economically left wing and very tied to organized labor. Uh, and these were guys that were part of, like, you know, they were in with the Teamsters Union, uh, the Teamsters Union. Uh, they were in with uh, the dock workers unions, uh, you know, around the country. And they would be, these were labor Democrats. They were kind of remnants, I guess you could say, of the old Roosevelt wing of the Democratic Party. Um, maybe not as progressive as Roosevelt, but they were still, they were guys that were pro-labor, pro-union, and they usually they, they kind of clashed with kind of the social liberalism that came out of the new left in the 1960s. They were usually big supporters of nuclear power. Um, and they were, they were also quite critical of Jimmy Carter's economic policies. You have to remember Jimmy Carter, you know, he put in Paul Volcker. And Paul Volcker implemented all kinds of drastic economic policies that just devastated the country. It used to be around the country, states, Local states had what they called usury laws that limited the amount of interest that a bank could charge. Um, it was called a usury law. And it was under Jimmy Carter that that was nullified, that the federal government said, oh, no, 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 states cannot regulate the lending of money. Only the federal government can regulate the lending of money. Um, and that was, that was huge, right? And that was Paul Volcker. And, and it was Jimmy Carter was kind of pushing an agenda of economic neoliberalism, while also pushing a very high level of social liberalism. You know, Jimmy Carter met with gay rights activists. He was never in favor as president, in favor of gay marriage or gay rights, but he did meet with gay rights activists. He did sponsor this huge women's conference um, around women's rights. Um, and he also, you know, he had the White House publish documents about, about climate change and global warming and documents warning about the danger of overpopulation, et cetera. Um, and the, 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 these, these old, old lower-level local Democrats, right, these smokestack Democrats, these labor Democrats, these, these Teamster guys, these guys that were, again, not socially liberal, usually very, you know, right-wing Roman Catholics when it came to issues like abortion, you know, they were not for the gay rights movement, you know, they were, these were, you know, conservative guys. Often they, they had supported the Vietnam War and were pro-military, but they were economic populists. And it was that layer of kind of economic populists, right? Um, you know, these, these kind of like populist, you know, politicians that were in urban centers and like the Teamsters and like the labor unions. That's who Jimmy Carter sent the FBI to just crush them, to just crush them. And, and in some cases, it was like, it was shocking. The media would just declare these guys to be guilty. And even though the tape would show them like shoving the, uh, the you know, the, the suitcase back to the politician, 
didn't matter. They went, they, their careers were destroyed. Um, it was big. And then labor, later, um, later the FBI, they, they followed up ab scam. They had the ab scam, you know, policy. They followed that up later with an operation called Bry Lab, which was short for bribe labor. Um, and Bry Lab was just, they just went after the Teamsters Union. It was mainly the Teamsters Union, right? And the Teamsters Union, you know, the Teamsters, right? That's, that's a very important labor union in this country. It was started by, you know, it was, it was kind of small when it originally started, but Trotskyites took it over. Uh, you know, Trotskyite communists, Farrell Dobbs, uh, James Cannon, uh, and they, they took over the Teamsters Union in Minneapolis in 1934, and they taught the Teamsters how to fight dirty. Uh, and how to be tough, uh, and you know they they unionized Minneapolis. The the truck drivers of Minneapolis were unionized. They had the 1934 general strike in Minneapolis, um, and the Teamsters, you know, they unionized uh, Minneapolis, and then they they launched what they called the Siege of the Midwest, where all throughout Kansas and Iowa and Nebraska, truck drivers were unionized into the Teamsters Union. Um, and after you know, obviously now when World War II started, the Trotskyite communists who were the leaders of the Teamsters Union went to prison because they were opposed to World War II because the Trotskyites didn't support World War II. The Trotskyites, you know, you know, the, the Communist Party supported World War II, but the Trotskyites didn't support World War II, so they went to prison. And uh, Jimmy Hoffa, uh, Jimmy Hoffa took over the Teamsters Union. And what was interesting is Jimmy Hoffa, you know, he had been trained by the Trotskyite communists. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa, you know, he had a background with the Trotskyites. Um, but he was not a communist. He was actually a Republican. Uh, Jimmy Hoffa was known for, for his sympathies to the Republican Party. Uh, but he'd learned how to be a labor organizer from Farrell Dobbs and from, uh, and from Farrell Dobbs and from the Trotskyite communists. So, you know, the Teamsters Union came out of World War II as one of the most important labor unions in the United States. Um, and, it was, it was, you know, the administration, I mean, first, I believe the first administration to go after them in the Kennedys, the Kennedy family went after the Teamsters Union. Uh, John F. Kennedy, you know, you know, called them before Congress, had some investigations. Um, and then later, uh, later it was und under Jimmy Carter, that Jimmy Carter targeted the Democratic Party politicians who were friendly to the Teamsters. And then later the FBI launched Bry Lab, you know, bribe labor uh, was what it was called. And they just straight up went after them. Now, Interestingly, um, uh, you know, the Teamsters Union, it's very interesting. So in, uh, in the 1990s, um, there was kind of an upsurge in the Teamsters Union. They, there, was a guy, um, uh, there was a guy in the Teamsters Union named Ron Carey, and he was the leader of the Teamsters Union. Um, Amlo. Uh, he was the leader of the Teamsters Union, and uh, he is the guy who unionized uh, UPS, right? UPS is, is unionized by the Teamsters. Um, my struggle. Um, and it was, it was unionized by the Teamsters. Um, and, uh, Ron Carey, you know, he was a very, very progressive leader of the Teamsters Union, and he was aligned with a kind of radical faction. Uh, within the Teamsters Union, there was a, a, a faction called the TDU, Teamsters for a Democratic Union. Um, and they were kind of, they were, it was a lot of Maoists, a lot of Trotskyites. It was kind of 1960s radicals, ex, you know, ex, you know, people who'd marched against the Vietnam War and stuff when they got jobs in factories and, and, you know, within the Teamsters Union, you had this communist faction called Teamsters for a Democratic Union. And it was aligned with the, uh, the Revolutionary Workers League, which was kind of a, a Trotskyite group. It was aligned with, um, the International Socialist Organization and the ISO, um, and some other, Groups. Uh, there were some of the the 1960s Maoist groups that were in there, and uh, Teamsters for a Democratic Union. And Ron Carey took over the Teamsters Union. Um, what's this one? Do you see the formation of American Yellow Vest movement? Oh, okay. Um, and they unionized P, uh, UPS. Um, you know, UPS um, became unionized. Uh, and after unionizing uh, UPS, it was Bill Clinton's administration that went after Ron Carey. Uh, and Ron Carey, ultimately, it was the federal government got involved, and they removed Ron Carey uh, from the leadership of the Teamsters. And it was Bill Clinton that sent the, uh, the federal government to go after Ron Carey. The Teamsters Union, it, it's very interesting because the Teamsters, 
uh, while they they've always been conservative. I mean, they they tend. I mean, not always, but post World War II, they were always a right wing Republican aligned union, and they kind of sometimes they would work for Richard Nixon, right? Richard Nixon used them to fight against the United Farm Workers uh, in California, right? Cesar Chavez, uh, you know, was very much friendly to the Democrats, um, and so you know, so you know, the Nixon administration tried to you know fight. Uh, Cesar Chavez um, uh, by sending in the um, by sending in the the Teamsters Union and ultimately the reason that Jimmy Hoffa was re- freed from prison was because of Richard Nixon uh, but the the Teamsters Union they have always been a very powerful militant labor union in the United States um, they had a reputation for you know for being corrupt and and fighting dirty um, in fact there's a movie uh, you could watch um, it's called F I S T or Fist, and it stars Sylvester Stallone. Uh, and Sylvester Stallone, you know, it's the guy from, um, um, you know, uh, Danny Shaw in Haiti. Yeah, I'll have that video soon. I'll have to edit some of that. But um, uh, but uh, Sylvester Stallone, um, he's in, you know, he's in this movie where he plays kind of a Jimmy Hoffa-like figure. Um, and uh, Sylvester Stallone, it's like he plays a... a you know, a tough union boss who's fighting for his workers. It's kind of fascinating. And there's an influence in the movie. You can kind of see the influence of the Trotskyite roots of the Teamsters Union. Uh, it's kind of interesting to read. There's a good series of books. The leader of the Teamsters Union, when it was run by Trotskyite communists, was a guy named Farrell Dobbs. And Farrell Dobbs wrote a series of books, four books um, about his leadership and how he, as a Trotskyite communist, led the Teamsters Union. Um, and the, the books are called... Uh, Teamster Rebellion, uh, Teamster uh, Politics, uh, Teamster Power, and Teamster B- Bureaucracy. And they're pretty good books, actually. I mean, Farrell Dobbs goes into great detail about you know what it was like to run this union as, as a communist. So it's kind of a fascinating history. But today is International Women's Day. March 8th is International Women's Day. Um, and that is a communist holiday. People don't know that. People just think it's one of these holidays. It was invented by the UN. Well, it was originally International Working Women's Day. And it was started here in New York City. Uh, here in New York City, for uh, there was a, a very horrific event called the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, where there, were, there was a, a factory where women worked, uh, you know, sewing clothes, triangle shirtwaist. I mean, they were making clothes. It was a sweatshop where these women made clothes. Um, and... Uh, and uh, these women were making clothes, and their boss didn't want them to sneak out, so he locked the doors. And the factory caught on fire, and they all died. It was a horrendous, horrendous event. Um, and it was, there was a huge amount of labor agitation around the horrendous event, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. And it was in response to the horrendous events of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, where all kinds of working-class women were burned alive in this factory by their greedy capitalist boss, Um, It was in response to that that the Socialist International uh, gathered and voted to make March 8th International Working Women's Day. And among the delegates who voted at this international gathering of of the Second International, the Socialist International, to create International Women's Day was Lenin. Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, who went on to be the leader of the Bolshevik Revolution, he was one of the delegates who voted to create International Women's Day. Um, Now, obviously, you're not going to hear that on American TV. They're not going to tell you that International Women's Day started out as a communist holiday. Um, But it did. Um, And it was celebrated in the Soviet Union. It was a a national day in the Soviet Union. And eventually, the United Nations adopted it. Uh, You know, the two holidays created by communism are May 1st, International Workers' Day, uh, and M- March 8th, International Women's Day. Those are the two holidays that were created by communists. Um, and it's interesting that both of them started in the United States. May 1st, International Workers' Day, comes out of the, um, of, of the, uh, the Haymarket uh, Rebellion in, in Chicago, where workers went on strike to demand the eight-hour workday. Um, and there was, you know, uh, it's a very important uh, event in American history. So, um, you know, uh, it's, it's fascinating that, you know, communism is not, you know, considered to be very influential in the United States, especially since the Cold War, but the two communist holidays, International Workers' Day and Working Women's Day, International Working Women's Day, both originated in the United States. I think that's particularly fascinating. So today we observe International Women's Day. Normally there'd be big demonstrations and stuff, but right now under the conditions of the pandemic, that's quite difficult. Um, 
So there you go. Um, I think that's that's important to be aware of. International Women's Day. Uh, that's today. Uh, so uh, there you go. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of giving you my thoughts on events. Um, you know, we're watching this mysterious silence from the Biden administration. I do want to give a shout out to Dust James and David Fox. Uh, Dust James and David Fox, great YouTube channel, uh, Anti-Imperialist America with Dust James. David Fox is also great. They're going to start uh, start a reading discussion group of this book, We Are City Builders, the new Center for Political Innovation Educational Manual. Um, and they're, dis they're discussing it. And a shout out to uh, Parasocialite. Uh, he's also been reading from this book. This is the educational manual of the Center for Political Innovation. Um, and uh, they folks are, are already studying it and leading classes around it. It is designed to teach you about Marxism and socialism. Uh, it's got study questions in it. It, is, it has got important selections from, from very important Marxist intellectuals around the world. Um, you know, so, um, if you want to start having reading groups and discussions of this book, I recommend it. It is designed to carry out political education. Um, that's what this book was put together for. The Center for Political Innovation is moving ahead. Uh, we had a great web conference. We're going to have another web conference this month. And, you know, as things start opening up, we are going to have some kind of national gathering, um, soon. Uh, we're going to have a three-day national retreat, at some point to, to make leadership plans, and then we will swing into action, uh, starting to have conferences, uh, educational conferences around socialism uh, across the country. Um, and uh, we're planning to do that because there are many people around the country who want to know about socialism, uh, would love to attend dynamic events with music and speeches and a real sense of community. Um, so there you go. Um, so I'm excited about the Center for Political Innovation and the big future uh, that it has as an organization. And I'm very excited about all of you. We are a great community on here. Did folks uh, get a chance to watch the uh, conversation I had with Infrared yesterday? That was a lot of fun. Uh, infrared, some of his energy wore off on me. So I absorbed some of his energy. That guy has got a huge amount of energy. And that energy kind of flowed into me, and we just had a great back and forth. It was a two-hour conversation, and uh, you know, we we just bounced off each other, and it was great. Um, he's got great in energy, infrared. Uh, very different approach than I have, right? Um, you know, you know, he obviously talks differently on his streams than I do, but uh, great energy. I, I felt really good about that conversation. Uh, you can watch it here on this channel. Infrared and I had a great conversation together. Um, so check it out. Um, that was really, really great. Um, and later tonight, hopefully, if not tonight, uh, tomorrow, I'll be posting the conversation, a great conversation I just had with Professor Danny Shaw. Professor Danny Shaw, who I interviewed once before on this channel, uh, he just got back from Haiti. And there is a huge uprising going on in Haiti right now. Um, um, all right. Jinping. Um, just got back from Haiti, um, and he is he has got some like on the ground reporting on on the struggle there against the the government in Haiti and how this you know this this Wall Street regime is impoverishing the population and the people are fighting back. Um, so that'll be coming up on the channel. Keep your eye out for it. So that's really what I've got. Those are my opening remarks. Um, I'm glad I can check in with you all. I'm going to be trying to stream more often on the next, you know, little bit. I'm going to try to be having these streams a little bit more often. We shall see. Um, but yeah, here we are. So on that note, folks, names and locations, names and locations. I will call you out as I see you. My opening remarks have concluded. And now I will give the roll call. March 8th, 1917, women textile workers started the February Revolution. All right, March. All righty. Cleveland, Pirate Alex, Chad from Kansas City, Kansas, San Antonio, Texas, Montreal, Ryan in Oakland, Branson, Missouri, Mo in Toronto, California, Springfield, Missouri, Ash from Calgary, Albany, Alberta, Los Angeles, B from Cleveland, Georgia, Nassau County, Char Char Darling. Uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, Amanda Freebore in Oklahoma. Very good. Um, 
all right? Uh, Wisconsin, Clyde Bank, David in China, Robert from Hawaii, Juan from Mexico, Chris from the great snowy Canada, Brazil, Larry Chavista, Oklahoma, Ramiro from East LA, welcome, Northern California, London, Brazil, Durban, South Africa, Troy in Kansas City, Missouri, Torrance, California, JT24 in Mississippi, France, Pomona, California, uh, Gainesville, Florida, locked in. Ithaca, New York, Michael is with us. Very good. Portland, Oregon, Orange Duke Gorillas, Mosin from Iran, Chicagoland, uh, Albany, New York, Samawa, Iraq, Babylon, Kieran from San Diego, Illinois, uh, Coraleo, West California, Dan from Iran, Brian Schaefer in Illinois. Welcome, 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 welcome. Treasure Coast, Florida with us. Seattle, Lumpy in Seattle. The Netherlands, the Rust Belt, Tyler is with us. Uh, neighboring borough of Staten Island, very good. Northern California, West Virginia. Joseph Wellington in New Zealand. Solidarity from Naples, Florida. Loved your talk with infrared. Thank you, thank you, Harold Sullivan. Fred from Alameda, California. Fairhope, Alabama, Napton, Napton, very good. What is Napton? I don't know what it is, but that's okay. I mean, it's, it's just a town, I guess. Redding, Pennsylvania, USA, Carmen Iglesias is with us. Welcome, Carmen. Glad you are here with us. Uh, Chicago Southside, says Dan. Welcome. Mianis, all right, very good. Welcome, Mianis. Very, very welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello from Melbourne, very good. Shout out to you, Eureka, Bolshevik, and Melbourne. Vallejo, California, Suleiman Lyle, very good. Raleigh, North Carolina, Sarar Adriana, welcome, welcome. Born in Kentucky, raised in Texas, living in Indiana, says Bradley Garrod. Knoxville, Tennessee, says Hound Dog, still feeling like Sunday, says Harold Sullivan. Oh, I just went through a Monday, so there you go. But hey, hey, I'm glad you've got that Sunday weekend feeling still with you. Right? The pandemic has made world a, the world a little bit weird for all of us. Rensselaer, New York. Woodlands, Texas, Libertarian Hellscape, says Chris. Very good. Well, not good. I'm sorry you're suffering out there in Texas, but glad I could give you a shout out. Toronto, Canada. Toronto. Very, very good. Eduardo. Well, thank you for the super chat, Eduardo. I'm glad you support what we're doing here. Super chats are always appreciated. Um, and I think I've given everyone their shout out. Um, so now I'm going to start answering the super chats, keep the super chats rolling in. I will answer the super chats. And when I'm done answering the super chats, then we're done for the night. So there you go. The show goes on as long as you want it to go on. Uh, someone, Mateo asked me for information. What information were you referring to, Mateo? What information were you thanking me for? Uh, the fact that I'm in my Brooklyn apartment, the fact that there's a bookshelf behind me. Uh, if it was just a good faith super chat, that's fine. But if there's a specific kind of information that was appreciative to you, uh, I would like to give that to you. Uh, so there you go. All right. I don't know who Dylan's Burns is, right? I, I, for a while at the beginning of this pandemic, I was debating everybody. I was debating everybody, and, and it was a good thing to do, right? Um, and before the pandemic, I debated a guy named Destiny, and that was a big, big hit. Um, and I debated Vosh, um, and uh, I debated Adam Kokesh, the Libertarian, and I debated some guy who was a leader of the Libertarian Party, um, and I, I debated Stefan Molyneux, uh, and I, I will debate different people. So I'll have to look into Mr. Dylan Burns. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of people who I'd love to debate who just won't debate me. Um, but if this Dylan Burns guy is somebody that I'd like to debate, and if he's willing to have a debate with me, I don't see why I wouldn't do it. Um, very good. Uh, the next super chat question was, a, uh, was Chaya was asking, where does Marx talk about feelings of oneness? Well, that's interesting. Um, what immediately comes to mind is uh, the quote from Karl Marx about religion. Now, we all know, right, those, those who are deeply religious are, are told that Karl Marx was their enemy uh, because Karl Marx said that religion was the opium of the people. Well, it's true that Karl Marx was an atheist, but the actual quote uh, from Karl Marx, where he says the opium of the people, is quite interesting. Karl Marx said that religion was the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. Indeed, it is the opium of the people. And that particular passage where he makes that, that 
phrase, right? He says it's the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. He's praising religion very vehemently. Um, he's saying that, you know, religion is something that, that you know, that, that people who are, who are oppressed by this system turn to to give them solace and to numb their pain. And you have to remember that, you know, that at the time that Marx was writing this, uh, opium, cocaine, uh, a lot of the street drugs that are now used had kind of a, had kind of a more medical connotation. Right, we know that it was very common. Like Sigmund Freud snorted cocaine and shot up cocaine. Actually, injected himself with cocaine. Um, we know that uh, the, throughout the Wild West, in the United States, you could go to a drugstore and buy cocaine with no prescription or anything. Right, and that uh, Coca Cola, right, it had cocaine in it, um, not caffeine, just cocaine. Um, and that opium was widely available. Um, you know, and in fact, some of the wealthiest Americans were involved in the uh, the opium trade with China. Um, and, uh, so when Karl Marx, you know, said religion is the opium of the people, he wasn't saying that, you know, people who, people who are religious are a bunch of drug addicts. Uh, he was saying that, that, uh, that, that it's something people use for med medicinal purposes. It's the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. But that's beyond, you know, that feeling of oneness, uh, that I, I quote, uh, from Sigmund Freud. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of Marx's quotations do not refer to that. Um, you know, Marx, again, in Marxism, you find, you know, the spirit of rebellion. If you read his pamphlet, The 18th Brumiere of Louis Bonaparte, it's all about this explosive feeling of rebellion, rebellion, rebellion. Um, however, there's a passage from Lenin that comes to mind. Um, you know, Lenin writes about revolutions, and he says, revolutions are festivals of the oppressed and exploited, and at such times, people are capable of performing miracles. Right? Rock, run, war. Wrote it down. At such times, people are capable of performing miracles. Um, you know, and he, he writes about that. Um, so, you know, um, there are there are different times um, that that you can get that, but you have to remember that Marx, Marx, Lenin, they don't write generally in a psychological way. They do not have a psychological approach. They have a materialist approach. They focus on the economic foundations. They focus on history, um, but they rarely. You don't find uh, Lenin or Marx uh, or Engels giving insights into people's mindsets and why they do things, what their motivations are. You don't see them talking about feelings and emotion. You get some of that in Marx's letters and some of the letters that he wrote. Uh, you know, he's talking about people he knows and, and why they do what they do. But these were not psychologists. I mean, the Marxism, the Marxist tradition is generally not psychological. Um, it's not. I mean, they're, they're, it's not a psychological tradition. So what Freud was observing, this feeling of oneness and community that he's observing um, in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents, and he's viewing it with contempt, right? I mean, he sees it in a very negative way. Um, that particular um, that particular thing, you're not going to see much of that in Marx. I mean, that particular quote about religion, uh, Lenin talking about the festival of the oppressed, but you don't generally get, you know, psychological insights in Marxist literature. You just don't. Uh, you don't. You tend to get economic insights. Uh, you tend to get tactical uh, analysis. Uh, you tend to get historical references. Um, one thing that I think is important um, is that, you know, one thing that has been very, very much lost, um, you know, is that uh, as much as uh, the Marxists were very knowledgeable about Marxism, they also were very well trained in classical history. You will find quotations from Hegel. Uh, you will find quotations from Plato. Uh, you will find references to Roman leaders, and uh, you'll find references to ancient Greece all throughout uh, Marxist literature. Um, and nowadays, you know, that's that. Back then, that was considered to be a standard part of education, right? If you were going to study politics, you had to know in great depth what went on in ancient Greece, what went on in ancient Rome. Uh, you know, you had to know about Charlemagne. You had to know about the development of European civilization. Uh, we don't teach that now. Uh, you know, I have made it a point, an effort to study the history of Rome. I'm, I'm trying to learn more on, on the history of Greece, um, dialectics of nature, unity of opposites, unity of opposites. Um, um, 
you know, um, I, I've made a point of teaching it to myself. Um, and, you know, but I mean, that used to be kind of the foundation. Um, you know, the founding fathers of the United States studied excessively. I mean, the most popular book at the time was Edward Gibbon's History of the Roman Empire, his eight volume History of the Roman Empire. And Benjamin Franklin and and Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, all of them just gobbled that book up. It was being published around the time of the American Revolution and they gobbled it up. And you'll notice that um, in upstate New York, uh, many of the cities have Roman names, Seneca, Syracuse. Uh, you know, you'll notice that in Washington, D.C., many of the buildings and the streets are almost designed after uh, ancient Rome and that that was, that was very important uh, to them and that, that, that the Roman Empire, uh, ancient Greece and Greek philosophy, this was all very important to the founders of the United States. They studied Hegel, or Hegel wasn't in ancient Greece, I'm sorry. They studied Aristotle, uh, they studied, you know, they studied Socrates and Plato and they studied this stuff extensively. It was very important for them as, as they were trying to build a new country. So, um, there you go. There you go. All righty. Um, uh, could a bourgeois under capitalism be a communist? Well, of, of course. Frederick Engels is a great example. I mean, Frederick Engels' father was the owner of a huge uh, textile factory. And Frederick Engels uh, made, was the owner of it later. He inherited it. And with the money from this textile factory, Frederick Engels funded a lot of the promotion of the Marxist movement. Um, there are many examples of individuals uh, who are quite wealthy who become sympathetic to Marxism. I mean, the, the first person to use the word socialism in English was Robert Owen. And Robert Owen was a capitalist in Wales, a wealthy factory owner in Wales, who devoted himself to building kind of socialist uh, communities and cooperative societies. Now, he never became a Marxist. He was a utopian socialist. But he was the first person to use the word socialism in English. And he eventually moved to Indiana. Um, all right, favorite, um, eventually moved to Indiana, uh, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to, you know, you know, build new harmony. Uh, so there you go. Um, and contemporary. All right. All right. So there you go. All right. AMLO. Well, look, AMLO is the leader of a popular front coalition. Uh, AMLO, uh, the president of Mexico, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, he leads a coalition. Uh, and in his coalition, there is a communist party, the PT or the Labor Party, which is a, a very big Marxist-Leninist party that exists in, in Mexico. Uh, there are some social democratic parties. Uh, there are some Mexican nationalist and populist parties. And it's a popular front government. Uh, AMLO is, a, is the leader of a popular front coalition government. Um, and he is negotiating, and it's kind of an alliance of different forces in Mexico. And, and he was only able to win the presidency because of Trump. Um, you know, prior to Donald Trump, there were many elections that it looked almost like he won. Um, you know, but, uh, but, you know, the forces in Mexico aligned with the United States. Many people believe, I think it was in 2006, that that election was rigged. Um, and that, there, you know, he believes he was the victim of rigged elections before. Um, but... Because Trump alienated the leadership of Mexico so much, there wasn't enough cooperation between the Mexican right wing and the U.S. government uh, and the U.S. right wing to stop AMLO. And AMLO was actually able to win the presidency of Mexico because of Donald Trump. Without Donald Trump being president of the United States, you would not have AMLO uh, being president of Mexico. And you'll notice that AMLO uh, was oddly sympathetic to Trump. Uh, he maintained that the election was stolen from Trump. Um, you know, and even though AMLO is a socialist, uh, a far left kind of guy, leader of a coalition, a popular front coalition government, um, you'll notice that, uh, that, you know, that he was somewhat sympathetic and argued that Trump had worked with him to, to renegotiate NAFTA. And that shows the contradictions of all of this. Now, so far, there has not been any dramatic move on the part of AMLO to change property relations. Uh, I mean, he is taken some moves to try and, you know, deal with the problem of drug crime in the country. Um, but, you know, it, it's an alliance. And when you're the leadership of an alliance, when you're right on the border with the United States, when you have big problems like drug cartels, it's, it's difficult. Now, obviously, if it was a communist party that had taken power in Mexico, things would look very differently. It's not. It is a left-wing kind of populist, anti-imperialist, you know, 
collaborate, uh, class collaborationist coalition government. It's a progressive government in Mexico right now, but I wouldn't call them revolutionary. I wouldn't call it a, a socialist government. I, they're not, Mexico's not a socialist country. They're not moving towards socialism. They do have a, a more anti-imperialist leader who's at the head of a, a broad coalition. And that's how I would describe the situation in Mexico. All right. Does class struggle continue under socialism? That's an interesting question. Now, I'm going to give just a straight-up answer to that, and then I'm going to address what you probably mean when you ask the question. Now, the straight-up answer is yes, right? In socialist countries, there tend to be a market sector. There tend to be private capitalists. And as a result, there is class struggle, right? In China, you bet there are strikes that go on. You bet there are protests that go on where the Mexican, uh, where the, the Chinese workers uh, you know, go on strike and struggle against Chinese capitalists. You betcha, right? Um, and in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, uh, there, was, there was the new economic policy. There were a lot of private capitalists and there were a lot of strikes and there were a lot of situations where the government had to intervene as the workers and the capitalists were fighting each other. Um, and the same goes on for Vietnam today. In Cuba today, there's definitely class struggle between the, the new layer of small business owners uh, and the, the working class. Uh, there, uh, there is definitely class struggle under socialism. The only way that class struggle is ended is when you reach full communism, when a society has, has reached the level of so much prosperity and abundance and so much, so much wealth has been created that that the need for, for any, uh, any inequality, the need for any government or coercion kind of just fades away. When there's so much stuff in the world that people can just take what they need and do what they, what they feel like doing in, in kind of a technological advanced stage where there's just so much abundance, uh, at that point, there's not going to be any class struggle. But until then, there's going to be inequality that exists. Until then, uh, there's going to be uh, clashes between different sections of society. Um, you know, until until you reach that ultimate stage of communism, there's going to be class struggle. Now, that's probably not what the person who asked the question was referring to. The person who asked the question is probably referring to a concept that Maoists uh, often will promote. Uh, Mao Zedong, during the Cultural Revolution, promoted the idea of class struggle under socialism. And that was a very different thing. And while, I, while there is actually class struggle in socialist societies, I don't agree with what Mao said and the Cultural Revolution said. It wasn't really Mao, but the Gang of Four and others, Lin Biao and others said when they talked about class struggle under socialism. Uh, the Gang of Four, um, Lin Biao, uh, they basically argued that a new bourgeoisie would emerge within the party. That people within the party would not have a pure communist line. Um, and as a result, they would become capitalist rotors, um, and they would they would you know, they would they would you know corrupt socialism from within, right? And that they argued the Soviet Union, even though even though the banks, factories, and industries were run by by the the state, and even though the Communist Party was in power, even though there wasn't you know profits in command. China looked at the Soviet Union and said, oh, no, it's the state bourgeoisie has taken over that, that somehow in the Soviet Union, um, you know, because they are not pure to the communist line, uh, the, 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 the Communist Party has become the new bourgeoisie. That was the argument that Mao used. And that was what was used to justify the Cultural Revolution, which was a mobilization of society, mainly of young people, into clubs called Red Guards, to attack and and you know to attack people in the Chinese Communist Party who did not agree with Mao or were accused of disagreeing with one thing or other, um, and I don't agree with that. Right, the Cultural Revolution was largely remembered as a disaster. Um, the Cultural Revolution hurt China's economy. Um, it 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 was a disaster. Now, obviously, there were some things about the Cultural Revolution. You know, people will acknowledge that that there was some. You know, whenever you have a huge mobilization of society like that, the result, you know, in addition to all the bad things that happen, um, you know, that you can sometimes have a good thing, right? Like I, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget this, right? Um, this is a great story, right? I had a college professor. Uh, at the time, I was a member of the Workers' World Party, which was a group that supported the Cultural Revolution. And I had a college professor, Dr. Wong, uh, who had been a teenager during the Cultural Revolution. And when I talked to her about the Cultural Revolution, she said, you know, the Cultural Revolution was very bad. She talked about a lot of bad things. But one thing she said is that she learned, uh, she became a college professor because of the Cultural Revolution. 
um, you know, she was female, uh, and there was not a lot of push in Chinese society to have women become college professors. But she was in the Red Guards, and she and all the other teenagers were deported from the cities, right? That's what they did. They deported all the teenagers from the cities. They said, they argued that basically if you lived in the cities in China, when 90% of the country lived in the countryside, you had privilege. So they deported all the teenagers to go live in the countryside. Um, and the young teenagers were in the countryside working on farms, and she was deported along with all the other teenagers to the countryside. And when she was deported to the countryside to start working on farms, um, you know, as she worked on, on the farm, this, this professor that I had, I remember she talked about how it was, you know, as she was working in the countryside, uh, that, that, um, that, you know, they had these evening classes, uh, where they would discuss, uh, communist politics. And she learned as a young teenager, 13, 14 years old, that she was very good at teaching the other red guards and the other young, young people about communism. And she would give lectures. She became, you know, responsible for political education and she gave lectures. And it was then as a young teenager that she learned that she wanted to become a professor. And she eventually became my professor in the United States. Now she didn't have a very positive opinion of the cultural revolution. Um, and you know, I mean, I don't think she was generally sympathetic to communism. Um, but you know, again, this is one minor positive that came out of the cultural revolution. Um, you know, is that she learned to, um, you know, she, she learned that she wanted to be a professor and that at that time during the cultural revolution in China, there was a big push for empowering women, right? That was a big part of it, right? Women hold up half the sky was the slogan. Uh, Mao Zedong's wife, Jiang Qing, was kind of the leader of the cultural revolution. So, so, you know, she, you know, in addition to all the bad things she remembered, she did have a, a positive, uh, a positive outcome of being empowered and discovering that she was a good professor. Um, one thing that I do remember was that, um, because, uh, you know, I started talking to her about, um, about the Gang of Four, um, and about the Cultural Revolution. And I mentioned that I had studied the, the writings of Sam Marcy, the founder of the Workers' World Party. And so she actually asked me if she could read them. So I gave her a pamphlet by Sam Marcy called The Suppression of the Left. And I remember she read it. She read it. Um, you know, she read it in full detail. And she said she was blown away by it. She said she had never encountered an American writer who knew in depth as much as Sam Marcy did about what was going on in China. When Sam Marcy talked about the fall of Lin Biao, uh, the rise of the Gang of Four, um, you know, I mean, I mean, she said that, uh, that, that, you know, that, that Sam Marcy really understood the Cultural Revolution with a lot of depth. And she was impressed by that because most American books she had read on the Cultural Revolution did not really understand what was going on. However, she also said to me, she said, this man is an extremist. And I said, what do you mean? And she said to me, she said, well, I lived there. I was part of the Cultural Revolution and you don't know how many people died and you don't know how scary it was. You know, Sam Marcy kind of, he understands the Cultural Revolution intellectually, but he doesn't really understand how horrific what was going on there. Um, and I think that she is largely correct that, you know, that, yeah, Sam Marcy, you know, he politically understood the Cultural Revolution, but there's a reason that the Gang of Four were defeated. There's a reason Deng Xiaoping came to power. And around the world, many communists were largely critical of Sam Marcy's writings about the Cultural Revolution because he didn't, you know, when the Gang of Four were thrown out and when Deng Xiaoping came to power and arrested the Gang of Four in China, uh, that, was, that was celebrated all throughout Chinese society. People saw the reform and opening up in 1978 as a great move. Um, meanwhile, uh, you know, if you, if you read the writings of Sam Marcy, uh, you would think that the reform and opening up in China was a step backward. It was a right-wing move, blah, blah, blah. Marcy didn't seem to understand. Um, and that's one of the flaws, I would argue, in a lot of Sam Marcy's analysis. But not just Sam Marcy's analysis. A lot of the analysis of people that you could call anti-revisionists, right, um, is that there's this feeling that if the Soviet Union had just, you know, stuck to, you know, the way things were during Stalin's time, everything would be okay. If China had just stuck to the hard line Mao way, uh, everything would be fine. And um, that's a bit naive, right? I mean, it's one thing to say that a lot of the problems escalated, right, in the Soviet Union in the post-Stalin years. And that's true. That's definitely true. Um, that's definitely true. Um, however, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, you know it, it, there's a reason. There's a reason these problems developed. Um, and that 
really existing socialism, the Cold War model of socialism, has had huge victories. And I go into great detail, the lie that communism doesn't work and it's, it needs to be refuted. Um, but at the same time, you know, you know, we, we need to admit that there's a reason that countries around the world, like China, like Cuba, like Vietnam, like Venezuela, modern communist countries don't adopt, they don't just def deflect to the old Cold War model. The, the Cold War model of socialism was very much a result of some specific circumstances, right? In the Soviet Union, it was, it was very interesting. Soviet Union, you had the communists, the Bolsheviks, who were the most left-wing people in the world, basically. I mean, they were far-left radical communists. Plus, you had, you had the peasantry of, of Russia, which were the most conservative people in the world, right? I mean, these were, these were the followers of the Russian Orthodox Church. I mean, so, you know, the most conservative people in the world and the most left-wing and radical and liberal people in the world merged, right? And, you know, again, this is the Hegelian dialectic. You have the most, you have the thesis, the Bolsheviks, you have the Russian peasantry, this, you know, the antithesis, and they clash, and the synthesis that you got was called really existing socialism. And it was Stalin. Joseph Stalin uh, was the individual. Stalin was a Bolshevik. He was literate. He'd been a leader of the Bolshevik party. But unlike a lot of the Bolshevik leaders, he wasn't from a wealthy family. He grew up in a tiny, small little village in, in Georgia. And, uh, you know, he, he was also from the peasantry. And Stalin was able to take the Bolshevik, you know, radical Marxist ideas and he understood the peasantry, and he created the model, the model that we got in the Soviet Union. And that's the thing. The Soviet Union was a combination of some of the most radical left-wing ideas at the time and some of the very deep conservatism of the Russian people. Um, and if you look at that, for example, the mausoleum, uh, you know, the fact that when Lenin died, Stalin put his body in this mausoleum on display in Red Square. What was that about? Well, it was an attempt, basically, to say that, um, you know, it was to, to basically to, to make Lenin into a saint and that Lenin's face went up everywhere. And this was religious, right? And some of the images of Lenin, it almost looks like he has a halo around his head, right? It was like he was kind of building a religious, a religious worship of Vladimir Lenin. Um, what else? Um, you know, uh, while the Bolsheviks had talked about abolishing marriage, uh, some of the early Bolsheviks had said that sex in a socialist society should be just as meaningless as drinking a glass of water. Stalin got rid of that. Stalin said that they were going to glorify the Soviet family, right? It would be a mother and a father who both would work and both would get education. It would be a mother and a father and kids. And he glorified the Soviet family and uh, the nuclear family in the United States that was promoted in the 1950s was kind of inspired by the Soviet family. Right? The, Soviet, the, the Soviets kind of invented the nuclear family, the nuclear family of the 50s, the leave it to beaver stuff, you know, the, the, the wife and kids. And, the, and the, that was kind of a knockoff on what the Soviets had already done. Post-World War II, the United States started promoting the nuclear family. But prior to World War II, Stalin had been promoting the Soviet family. Um, you know, Stalin outlawed abortion. Right? He said that abortion was illegal, outlawed abortion. Stalin outlawed homosexuality. People went to prison for being gay under Stalin. Um, you know, and that's that, uh, that, you know, in many, in many ways, the imagery of the Soviet state mimicked feudalism, right? Stalin was kind of viewed by the population like he was the king almost, right? I mean, he wasn't, right? He was, he was elected by the, the Soviet Communist Party. They, they elected him. But, but, you know, I mean, but in the way he was presented in the media, Stalin looked like he was the king. He looked like a czar, um, you know, and that Stalin, you know, he, he used kind of the emotions and the feelings and the traditions of Russia, as well as the radical economics and, and philosophy of the Bolsheviks and kind of combined them into that model of really existing socialism. Um, and during the Cold War, uh, that model of really existing socialism uh, was exported. And it would, you know, Cuba has that system, Vietnam had that system, China had that system, uh, you know, and that system, I mean, it, it eradicated, you know, illiteracy in many countries. It industrialized many countries. Um, you know, I mean, it, it built power plants. It redistributed land. You can't say that system failed. It had big achievements, but it had to change. It had to change. In order to survive, it had to change. Um, and the Soviet Union, they, they, they were unable to change it in a way that it could survive. 
Uh, they, they tried to, to change it in the 80s with perestroika and glasnost, and the result was that it destroyed the Soviet Union. They were unable to bend, so they broke. However, China, they were able to adjust their socialist system in a way that made it more effective. Socialism with Chinese characteristics, Deng Xiaoping theory, was very effective. Um, you know, Vietnam, they've been able to adjust their socialist system to adopt the socialist-oriented market economy, and, it, and, it, and it's been very effective. And Cuba, um, you know, and now we have many socialist countries around the world, Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, Nicaragua. Uh, these countries have adopted a, a socialist system where the state controls the banks and the factories and the industries, where the means of production are forced to work in the interest of society. You have a state, a government of action that fights for working families, but you also have small business owners. And in, in, instead of fighting those small business owners, the government props up and subsidizes those small business owners. Um, you know, in Nicaragua, the Sandinistas have worked very, very hard to, uh, to build up uh, what they call, um, what they call micro entrepreneurs and, uh, they are supported by the state. Um, and, uh, you can see that in China as well. They've, they've worked very hard to build up a layer of capitalists who depend on, on the state. Um, and that's how China has been successful. So, you know, they, they, they are able to kind of harness the strength of capitalism to strengthen a socialist planned economy. Um, and, and this is something that has been largely successful. But socialism is always changing. You know, what Stalin developed in Russia, the, the really existing socialism, was very effective. It defeated the Nazis. It conquered outer space. The, the first, you know, space travel was, was from them. Uh, the first cell phone was invented by them. They electrified the whole country. They wiped out illiteracy. They had more hospital beds per capita uh, than any other country in the world. I mean, the Soviet Union had big achievements. But socialism constantly needs to change. Um, you know, um, you know it, it constantly needs to needs to be evolving and adapting, right? That's, that's how these things work, that, that socialism is not stagnant um, and that socialism, in order to survive, has to adjust. And especially when countries that are building socialism are building it surrounded by Western capitalism and under attack, uh, the way that that socialism develops has to adjust and change. You know, Cuba is changing. These countries are changing. And that socialism is, is not the same everywhere. Okay, that was a long answer. All right, American yellow vests. Well, the Yellow Vest is kind of a class struggle movement in France of, of working class people that are angry. Um, they're not traditional leftists and they're not traditional right wingers either. Uh, they're just working class people that feel the elites of France don't care about France's working people. Um, and it's kind of an explosion of popular anger. And something like that is already happening in the United States. There's lots of angry working class people in the United States who don't feel comfortable with the traditional left, which is focused on identity politics. They don't feel comfortable with the racism and the bigotry of the right wing. Um, yeah, so I think something like the Yellow Vest will probably emerge in the United States very soon. I will be uploading the Danny Shaw video uh, at some point uh, very soon. I, I interviewed him this afternoon, great interview about Haiti. I need to edit in some of the footage he sent me. I can't just upload it, I have to interview, uh, add the stuff, so there you go. Um, uh, will Xi Jinping, is Xi Jinping the greatest statement of the 21st century? Well, it's only 2021, okay? I mean, so the 20th century, we still got 79 more years. So I can't say for sure that Xi Jinping will be the greatest statesman of the 21st century because the 21st century still has 79 years left in it, right? You, in 1921, you couldn't say who the greatest statesman uh, of the 20th century was, right? So in 19... In 2021, I can't say who the greatest statesman of the 21st century will be. I think Xi Jinping is pretty important, and he's done a lot of very important stuff, and he's done a lot of good things for China, but we shall see. Um, we shall see. I mean, I can't say for sure, um, you know, but, you know, he's definitely pivotal. Um, now, someone super chatted. Uh, someone super chatted about the fact that March 8th, 1917 in Petrograd was the beginning of the Russian Revolution, right? Well, you know, it's interesting because we call it the February Revolution, but that's according to the old Russian calendar, the Gregorian calendar, right? And so on, is it the Gregorian calendar? Did I get that wrong? The old Russian calendar, right? It was February, but according to our calendar, it was March. But yeah, um, you know, that basically the Tsar of Russia was, he was losing the war, um, you know, and he was viewed as an incompetent leader. And many people wanted the czar to, to lose, um, to, to step down. Uh, many of the Russian capitalists wanted that. So uh, usually uh, when there was a, um, 
a, a protest or a rebellion, the police would just come and arrest everybody. But um, in 1917, um, you know, March 8th, there was a, a protest um, by Russian, uh, Russian women. Um, you know, it was a strike uh, down with the war, down with the czar. And instead of, um, you know, the police came to arrest them, but then the Cossacks, the, you know, police on horseback, the mounted soldiers, uh, came and, uh, and beheaded the police um, with their swords. And they supported the, the women on strike. And pretty soon the, sprite, the strike then spread all throughout Petrograd or St. Petersburg. Um, uh, you know, and that's, that was, and eventually the czar stepped down. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was a strike all throughout St. Petersburg and, and the czar stepped down from power. And it was supported by many of the wealthiest capitalists who thought the czar was incompetent, thought that the Russian autocratic system, the old czarist system was inefficient. You have to remember the Bolsheviks didn't take power until October or November, according to our calendar. Um, that was much later. But orig the original Russian Revolution was simply to remove the czar. After the czar was removed, and you had what came into power was the um, provisional government, which was led by Alexander Kerensky. Uh, and the provisional government was not sure. Um, you know, they wanted, they basically, they continued fighting World War I, but there were many people in the provisional government who did not want to fight World War I. Um, and that was a big divide. Some of the people in the provisional government wanted to continue the war. Some didn't. The Bolsheviks were known as the anti-war party. They wanted to end Russia's involvement in World War I. Um, and most of the capitalists in Russia, uh, or a big, big chunk of them, wanted to continue it. Um, so in September uh, of 1917, Kornilov, uh, who was a general uh, in the Russian military, uh, started trying to overthrow the provisional government. Um, and he was going to set up a military dictatorship to continue Russia's involvement in World War I. Um, and so uh, Kornilov started marching towards St. Petersburg, and he was going to overthrow the provisional government and establish a military dictatorship to continue World War I. What happened then is the Bolsheviks started organizing the people of St. Petersburg to, to repel the Kornilov reaction, basically to, to fight off Kornilov when he came to try to come to St. Petersburg and become the dictator. And so as that was happening, um, you know, many, many, many soldiers in Kornilov's military didn't want to go and shoot down, you know, ordinary people who didn't, you know, and so they were defecting. A lot of soldiers were quitting and eventually Kornilov turned around. They didn't attack St. Petersburg and set up a military dictatorship. Kornilov, Kornilov's reaction was defeated by the Bolsheviks. Um, and at that point, the Bolsheviks in the process of building up this, this defense force to protect St. Petersburg from the Kornilov reaction. Um, you know, a lot of the regular army, uh, a lot of their weapons were handed over to the Bolsheviks. Uh, the Bolsheviks started to have a bigger army uh, than the, 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 the regular provisional government. And so after repelling the Kornilov reaction, the Bolsheviks declared the Soviets, the workers' councils that they had set up, they declared them to be the government. Now, uh, there had already been, it was like there were two governments in St. Petersburg. You had the provisional government and you had the Soviets or the, work, the councils, the workers' councils. Um, the Bolsheviks basically declared, you know what, the workers' councils, they're the new government. And they had a bigger army at that point, right? They, they had a bigger army. They, they had forced Kornilov to, to stand down and repelled the Kornilov reaction. And so at that point, uh, you know, they, they took over the Winter Palace and, and the telegraph offices and they said, we're in charge now. Um, and they declared the, the councils that they had built to be the new government. That's how the Russian Revolution happened. Fascinating history. Um, look, the Iraq-Iran War. Well, look, I, I think the Iraq-Iran War was one of the greatest tragedies that we've seen. Um, it was horrendous. Uh, I mean, it was a horrendous, horrendous conflict. Um, uh, okay, I should check out this app. Okay. I have a lot of apps on my phone. Um, it was a horrendous conflict. Um, and... Saddam Hussein, uh, you know, had you know had kind of a revolutionary government, Baathist Arab socialism, and he attacked the Islamic Republic of Iran, also a revolutionary government that had taken power, uh, not capitalism but Islam, uh, neither east nor west, war of poverty against wealth, a revolutionary government and a revolutionary country that I visited, um, and the U.S. imperialists uh, basically at the beginning of the war they were supporting Saddam Hussein, um, but later, about halfway through the war, they started supporting Iran. And the goal was to play the two countries against each other. 
Uh, the goal was to weaken both countries. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it was a horrendous war and the scars and pain from that war are still very, very alive in Iranian society. Um, you know, every neighborhood, they have the face. I've been to Iran and I've seen every neighborhood, they have the faces of the martyrs from that neighborhood, the people who died in that war. Uh, it's a horrendous thing. And the fact that our government was so cynical and manipulative that at first it would support Saddam Hussein. And then it would, you know, you had Iran Contra, you know, so then they would sell missiles to Iran. It was, it was, you know, again, this is the strategy uh, of big new Brzezinski and Henry Kissinger. It's to play revolutionary forces against each other, right? Uh, in in big new Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard, where he refers to Eurasia, he says the goal is to keep the barbarians killing each other. And this is what they did in, in Southeast Asia. During the Vietnam, after the Vietnam War, after the USA withdrew from Vietnam, the CIA supported Pol Pot and Pol Pot attacked Vietnam. And then China invaded Vietnam uh, to, to support Pol Pot in Cambodia. And communists, um, communists were killing other communists all throughout Southeast Asia. And this was a far more effective strategy, right? Brzezinski and the soft power CIA manipulators is far more effective than having the U.S. troops there and killing communists. It's much more effective to play communists against each other. COINTELPRO, the, 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 how they played the Black Panthers against other black revolutionaries, how they play socialist groups against each other, the toxic culture on the internet. You can bet the government is in there trying to you know, foment that toxic culture among internet leftists. This is a long-time strategy. If the government just goes after people, people tend, revolutionaries tend to come together you know, to stand against the oppressor. And that applies around the world, right? If, if, if the United States attacks Vietnam, people in the developing world are going to say, down with imperialism and rally around Vietnam. The United States attacks Iran, well, people around the developing world are going to stand with Iran. But if the USA covertly pays one group to covertly attack another group, that makes everything confusing, right? So, you know, instead of, instead of, uh, instead of sending uh, this, the, well, I don't want to get into specifics, but, you know, instead of sending uh, the, um, instead of sending the government to round up somebody uh, who's, you know, building a socialist movement in the United States, instead you find somebody else uh, who calls themselves a socialist to start nasty rumors about that person and threaten them and be violent, right? And play these forces against each other, right? This is, this is, there's, you know, it's, it's in, uh, there's a manual that was published by the Pentagon. It's called um, um, uh, Handbook to Fourth Generation Warfare. And it was written by William S. Lind. William S. Lind, uh, and it's, it's a guidebook to low-intensity warfare or fourth-generation warfare. And they talk about these kind of strategies and how, you know, you manipulate non-state actors against each other. I mean, this is, based, this, is, this is the newly, you know, developed counterinsurgency. There's a movie called The Battle of Algiers that talks about, that used to be, the, you know, the war of attrition, uh, the IRA, you know, the way that these communist you know, national liberation struggles would, would, would be fought, the communists would be successful because they would isolate the imperialists, they would play into people's feeling of national superiority, etc. So over the course of the Cold War, you developed a much more sophisticated, you know, tactic of, of, of defeating revolutionary movements, right? And you talk about Frank Kitson um, in his book Gangs and Counter Gangs and how he maneuvered uh, in Northern Ireland by funding uh, Protestant uh, fanatical groups to kill to kill IRA people um, and, and, you know, developing counter gangs. Uh, you know, you can talk about, about what was done and big new Brzezinski around the world. Now, this is the more strategic way of handling, uh, handling um, insurgents and handling resistance around the world, right? And that governments can use this. Uh, it's used by the imperialists globally, right? It's a way of, um, it's a more effective way of managing resistance uh, as, if, as, if you, um, as if you manipulate uh, different forces against each other. Uh, you create suspicion, you know, but if you just, you know, if you just have the government arrest, you know, if the government today arrested all the leaders of communist groups, there would immediately be a huge amount of sympathy for them. Because we'd be like, hey, they're just being communist. They shouldn't be arrested. Well, the government knows that, right? The ruling class in the United States knows that, right? That if they just went and arrested everyone who was a communist and threw them in jail, there would be a lot of people going, hey, we have the right to be a communist. That's not right. So what do they do? 
you know, um, well, you know, you create an atmosphere where you're a tanky. Yeah, you're a Nazbol. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is this is a much more effective way of managing managing the left, right? And that, you know, there's big foundation money that subsidizes certain people who claim to be socialists but put put out a pro-imperialist message. That's that's pretty well documented, um, you know, and that, uh, you know, you talk about the State Department socialists and, you know, go into detail, right? And it, it's a much more effective way of managing these things, much like, um, well, I, I've given, I've rambled about that too long. I think you know what I'm saying. All right. Um, and the Iraq-Iran war is a horrendous crime, a horrendous crime. Um, yeah. Uh, the unity of opposites. Well, this is a, a, a dialectical concept, right? This is, again, where this is the philosophical side of Marxism, okay? Hot and cold. Right? You can't have cold without hot. You can't have hot without cold. There are two opposites that are dependent upon each other. High and low. You can't have high without low. You can't have low without high, right? That, that if you said something's low all by itself, that would mean nothing because something would have to be high to compare it to. You said something was cold, it's just cold, but there was nothing that was hot. You wouldn't know what cold means because you only know what cold is in comparison to hot. This is the unity of the op of opposites. Things that are opposite of each other define each other. Uh, do indigenous anti-colonial independence movements fits into the context of anti-imperialism? Um, indigenous anti-colonial. Um, that's that's what unity of opposites means, right? That there are there are opposites that define each other, right? Something is hot and something is cold, you know, they're related. Something is high, something is low, because they're related. That's the unity of opposites. That's a dialectical materialist concept. Favorite contemporary communist women. Um, well, what does contemporary mean? I mean, living right now? I mean, in terms of living right now, um, I would say Dulce Rodriguez of Venezuela, amazing contemporary communist woman. Uh, my friend Dakota Lilly has met her a number of times. Um, she's definitely a communist, uh, vice president of Venezuela. She's awesome. Rosario Murillo, right? Uh, the Sandinista, former guerrilla fighter, revolutionary of Nicaragua. Uh, she's really awesome. Uh, uh, who else? What other contemporary communist women uh, do I would I would I really like? You know, there was a woman who was the leader of the of the Communist Party of Greece for a long time. She was very cool, uh, and she did a, had a lot of amazing speeches. I would watch on the internet. She was she was very amazing. Uh, there's an important uh, Marxist uh, art ideological thinker. Um, in, um, in um, Latin America named Marta Harnecker. Uh, she's written a lot about 21st century socialism and what it means. Um, I've learned a lot from her, absolutely. Um, you asked about contemporary, meaning like not in the past, but, but currently. Um, you know, um, now somebody mentioned Isabel Dos Santos. Well, Isabel Dos Santos is part of the, um, of the political party uh, in Angola, the MPLA. Um, and I've written a lot about her because when she was running the uh, the state-run oil industry in Angola, uh, she was using the state-run oil industry to benefit the people of Angola. And she has, you know, she's very much used uh, used her own wealth as well as the wealth of of the of the state-run industries uh, of Venezuela or of of Angola. She's used them for the benefit of the population. So the big oil companies ousted her. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like Isabel dos Santos a lot. Um, you know, I, I definitely would consider her to be a socialist. I don't know how influenced she is by Marxism. Um, but, you know, she comes from a family that fought, you know, a, a revolution to free Angola from Portuguese colonialism. Um, she has an anti-imperialist perspective. She's very sympathetic to China, uh, and to Russia and to the developing countries around the world that are fighting for their national liberation. Um, but you know, I mean, I, she doesn't espouse Marxism. I've never heard Isabel dos Santos go around promoting socialism or communism. I've never heard that, right? I mean, she promotes the empowerment of young women. Uh, she promotes economic development. Uh, I think she's very sympathetic to the Belt and Road. Um, but she's not a communist. I mean, I've never seen anywhere Isabel dos Santos described as a, uh, as a, as a Marxist Leninist or a communist. I think she's someone who, you know, she is a figure, uh, in, in, the government of a socialist country, Angola, um, and uh, she has worked for economic development. She has aligned herself with many socialist countries around the world. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call her necessarily. She's not like Dulce. Rod Dulce Rodriguez quotes Marx. She's a leader of a Marxist party. 
right? Rosario Murillo quotes Marx and Lenin extensively and is leading Nicaragua. Uh, Isabel dos Santos is a little bit different, uh, a little bit different than that. Um, but, you know, the woman who was leading the Greek Communist Party for many years, uh, very amazing, uh, very ideological. Uh, you know, I mean, look, I've learned a lot from Jyoti Brar. Uh, Jyoti Brar, um, you know, while, you know, people disagree with her on one issue and, or another, uh, her dynamic presentations. Jyoti Brar gave an amazing speech years ago called What October Means to My Generation. Amazing. Um, and now she's leading the Workers' Party of Great Britain. Um, you know, and I find Jyoti Brar to be an amazing and an, an inspiring figure in many, many ways. Uh, Jyoti Brar, I would check out Jyoti Brar's speeches uh, what October means to my generation, et cetera. Again, you know, her and I don't agree on everything. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't share her analysis of modern Russia. Um, you know, um, um, and uh, you know, I I you know, I think that um, well, anyway, I don't have to get into every detail, but you know, Joti Brar is amazing. I really admire Joti Brar in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, those we're talking about contemporary communist women. Um, her video on proletarian feminism, Dust James just talked about, is great, where she critiques uh, bourgeois feminism versus proletarian feminism. Very good stuff. Do indigenous anti-colonial movements fit in with anti-imperialism? Of course. Why wouldn't they? I mean, why wouldn't they, right? If indigenous people, people indigenous fighting for their homeland against the imperialists, why wouldn't they fit in with anti-imperialism? That's pretty basic. Pretty basic. That's anti-imperialism, right? Um, you know, um, you know, sometimes there are specific indigenous separatist groups that can be used by the imperialists against a broader national liberation struggle, but that's beside the point, right? You know, if you want to, you're just asking just straight up, do indigenous resistance groups fit in with anti-imperialism? Of course they do. Of course they do. All right, cool. Well, folks, I think I'm going to cut this off for tonight. Um, it's been a pleasure engaging with all of you. Um, and I'm hoping to do more lives uh, this month than I did last month. So hopefully I'll be doing another one of these very soon. Stay tuned. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, keep an eye out for the chat about Haiti, the interview about Haiti that I did today that I'll be posting very soon. A new upsurge in the struggle against U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression with the people of various countries, have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. While the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. While the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today. <laughs>